you came in, your parents, and you immersed yourself in hip hop culture. So yeah. I, you know, the, the flip is interesting. What drew you, cause you had choices, Eddie Huang. You had, your dad was doing well, you know, your path, you know, you went to school, you got your law degree, you know, you, you, you didn't have to do that. What drew you to hip hop? Well, I saw a lot of other <clears throat> kids in my community that assimilated more to whiteness, you know? And I saw that in the assimilation of whiteness, there was like a false freedom that you get. But, but part of that assimilation is that you have to leave your old self. You got to leave your ancestors and a lot of your values and customs and full on identity behind to ascend to whiteness. And then when you ascend to that whiteness, you really just a lap dog. You know, you're not a real full participant. You, you get to be in the building, but you, you have to remain quiet. And for me, I was, I was always picked on. And, and I ended up going to like five schools in seven years at one point. And there was always, you know, I'm at a new school. Someone going to call me an egg roll. Someone going to call me a Chinaman. And like from the age of five years old, um, someone called me you know, a Chinaman and pushed me off the slide and broke my arm. And, and my dad just taught me, my dad said, look, you come home beat up, I'm gonna beat you up again. You know, and, and so I learned, I was like, well, I'm gonna have to fight or I'm gonna get Wait, beat hold up. on, hold on, Eddie, Eddie, hold on. That, that's, that's what black kids learn. <laughs> that, that's a black parent advice to a child. If you show up, I, I will whoop your ass, right? That's yeah. how, your father, we don't think about the Asian culture as having, those hands, but apparently you had those hands. Yeah, I mean, you my dad definitely had hands. My dad, bad dad definitely had like wooden collar sticks too. But like, you know, the, you know that you, you identify something that's very interesting. And, and I, I, I was talking to Ta-Nehisi Coates once and he was asking me the same question, but it was, my dad raised me the way he did, but it felt so alien in America because white people don't raise their children that way for the most part. And I remember going to the grocery store and seeing like white kids in the cart would like knock over apples or oranges. And, and the mom would just, somebody will pick that up. And they expect some Mexican guy or some black guy is going to come over and pick that fruit up and their kids are customers so they could do no wrong. But I remember seeing like a Muslim black kid once like bust a grape and his mom like just smacked him upside the head and was like, now we got to buy these grapes. And my mom was the same way. My mom was like, don't bruise the fruit. Don't embarrass us. Cause you bruise the fruit. We're going to have to buy it, you know? And, and we would buy it because we didn't want people to think we were not well behaved or that we were poor, you know? And, and I just started to see little things like that, you know, in the community. And, and I just said, well, I definitely don't relate to white culture and whiteness. I don't see that many Asians. And I just started to turn towards black culture um, for answers and for solidarity and to feel less alone and alien because uh, a lot of the other kids at Chinese school, their, their parents just relented and they started to be like, all right, the kid wants to eat McDonald's, just let him eat McDonald's. My dad was very tough and was like, we are not raising you that way. You're going to know everything about our culture and then you're going to go out in the world and you're going to represent us the right way. Why I need 866-801-8255. Drew McCaskill's here. Eddie Huang is here. Uh, Fresh Off the Boat was a book, because um, you know, I remember about a deck, uh, almost a, 10 years ago, right? Uh, 20, um, it came out, yep. Eight okay, years. and and it was uh, amazing. It was groundbreaking, you know, but it was you telling your story. It started as a blog, just telling your story, Fresh Off, off the Boat. Now uh, it turned into a, a TV series, which I'm sure a lot of people know on ABC, uh, inspired, which you actually narrate. Um, and, and I'm, you know, as I'm reading your bio, I'm like, you, you, you are English major, so I already love you, right? <laughs> um, went to law school, because, you know, I'm sure your parents are like, you got to get, <laughs> you better go do something valuable. Yeah. But then stayed in the arts, got into restaurant. I mean, like there's, I, I've been saying this to, to people, this, and, it, and it resonated with me. I was raised jack of all trade, master of none. But I'm like, no, experience all facets of who you are. Be all of who you are. Don't let people put you in a box. If you're good at singing and law, sing and do law. You know, don't, if you can write and at the same time, you know, code or do both. I, I think it's important that people explore, explore all facets. Is what allowed you to be able to do that? Well, exactly what you said. 
you know, and, and every experience that you have is an advantage. And like, this is a very strange example because people wouldn't even see this as an advantage, but you know, I was arrested uh, when I was 19 and I went through the system. I was on felony probation. Um, wow. And it, it, it was really detrimental to my life. I couldn't get jobs, but I applied to law school. I got into Cardozo Yeshiva and I applied to Cardozo for one main reason, because they had the Innocence Project Clinic there. And I was very interested in, in social justice, especially as it applied to criminal law, because I had a very insane experience. And while applying to schools, going through the system was not an advantage. When I applied to the Innocence Project, there was an incredible attorney named Vanessa Potkin that didn't look down on me, that didn't judge me. She listened to what I had to say about my background. And she's like, you know what? I'm gonna hire you for the Innocence Project because you a hustler. And I know that if we need evidence, we need to find a rape kit, you gotta pick up the phone and, and you gotta get somebody to do something, you're gonna do that. And your experience is gonna be helpful and you're gonna be able to talk to our clients in a way that like other students won't because you've had this experience. And I, I was like, that's what I was reminded of when you said, if you like to sing and you want to be an attorney, do both. Like you could be a music attorney. You know, it, it's every single experience you have as a human, you got to make it work for you. There is a way to take advantage of it. Eddie, you know, it's interesting um, when you talk about, uh, Karen was talking about your story and, 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 um, and fresh off the boat. Uh, I know that you've said in the past that what started off as your story of being, you know, really, really clear and kind of gritty got very sort of, you know, Disney eyes and Hollywood eyes, right? Like they gave us like a Disney World version of your story. Yeah. Uh, talk about like the difference between like the actual representation and real, this represents my real story. Everyone wants representation. And, and I feel like representation is not enough and it's too easy because Hollywood's answer is like, all right, cool. Like we need to put these faces with this skin on television and movies to get y'all to watch, cool. But we're gonna put our words and our stories in their mouths. And that's really how I felt with Fresh Off the Boat. And uh, you know, I, I always wanted to write it. I always wanted to show run it. I was never given a shot and uh, because Everyone, every step of the way would just tell me like, America's not ready for that. They don't want that. White people are not gonna understand a lot of the things are fresh off the boat. They're not gonna understand that perspective. And I was like, listen, everybody faces pain and struggle. What I'm asking you to do is to tell our story without stripping it and sanitizing it of the pain and struggle that we faced. And the seminal moment for me with that production was, they asked me to say a lie where, a Jewish, the line was, a Jewish kid, a black kid, and an Asian kid go to a hip hop concert. Isn't America great? And the concert they had the kids go to was the Beastie Boys. And my first concert was Outkast, Equemini, House of Blues, Orlando, you know? And I ran up in there with a bottle of Seagrams in my jeans and me and my brother got lit. And I was like, that's what we did. So them kids should go to Outkast concert, not a Beastie Boys concert. And I was like, of all the options, yeah. you chose a white hip hop group and you sell this show as a show about an Asian family with a kid that loves hip hop, but where are the black people? And, and even if you, are, you don't have black people, like at least hold it down, be 10 toes down and have them go to a show with a hip hop group that, that I think represents the culture more, you know? like. I love the Beastie Boys and they're great people. And I think the Beastie Boys themselves would be like, send them to a Mob Deep show, you know? Right. <laughs> and, and so when they turned on the mic, I said, I don't want to say this. And like, yo, if you want to get paid, you're going to say this. And I said, all right, cool. A black kid, a, a, an Asian kid and a Jewish kid go to a hip hop show. Isn't America three fifths great? And that was, that was just can, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I stay you know, 10 toes down. I, I, I love it that you're talking about that because there's so much of our of our stories that are now being that are now being told and uh, so many of our icons that are that are being featured in in content and 
that notion that you can write a great story, you can sell a great story, but then you got to be careful about how much control you give other people in terms of telling that story. How has that changed how you've moved in other deals that you've done or how you've decided to get your content out since Fresh Off the Boat? Well, I will say it's completely pressure from the people spending money and the audience that is changing this. And there are a few good white people in positions like Cujo at Focus, you know, my boss at Focus is a fantastic person and, and they want to do the right thing. And there's still always this friction where it's like, is the audience going to understand this? And when people say the audience, they're thinking mainstream, white people. But, you know, when we look at the metrics, right, I'm like the number one Come on. audience. Come on. We're fresh off the boat for Boogie. When we tracking, it's Latinos and black people. Yeah. You know, like, at least for my work, that that's who's spending the most money on it. And I was like, they're going to... But Eddie, but it's always been. Drew, Drew worked for a company that tracked viewership. <laughs> and we know, like, WB, you know, PIX, uh, In Living Color, you know, they use, they use us to build their network all the time, right? So they know that we make money for them. So what's, what's really the deal, right? Yeah. I, I'm struggling right now because we know that we over index black people, Latino people, Asian people over in maybe not Asians, black and Latino people over index and watching we're over indexing on social media of all other groups, but we don't get the respect or, you know, like what, what are they afraid of? Did they, they just always assume that other white people aren't going to get it. And I'm like, you white, you get it. Like we good. And then also white people aren't the ones spending the most money on this. And for once, could we just drag them along? Because they've been dragging us along for hundreds of years. Yeah. And I'm like, for once, could, they, could we just like have them catch up? And I think that there is even a sentiment within the white community now, which is like, I right, like, we need to stop holding this up. This train is running dumb slow because of us, you know? And, and I, I, I hope that this change continues. And I hope that white people can just, encourage themselves to be a little bit more curious and a little bit more like, let me watch something and learn something instead of being like spoon feed it to me. They want to take your stories and, and it's like, can you make it a smoothie for me? So this is just easier to consume. I'm like, nah, bro, chew your vegetables. You know? <laughs> oh, this is better than vegetables.